Hi, I'm Joel Eriksson from the BitSec R&D team, and these are my colleagues, Klaus Nyberg, Christer Oberg, and Carl Janmar. This talk about, is about kernel vulnerabilities in general, and kernel mode exploitation in particular. We'll begin with a short introduction to the topic, followed by several real-world examples and demonstrations of kernel mode exploits that we have developed ourselves. So, why exploit kernel-level vulnerabilities? Well, first of all, the real reason behind most things in life, and perhaps especially here in Vegas, because it's fun. Also, there's not many people doing it yet, so still plenty of bugs around to play with. Uh, exploiting at the kernel level also means that we can bypass most defense mechanisms and any kinds of restrictions such as file permissions, ACLs, secure levels, etc. And since we target operating system itself, we don't have to rely on how the system is set up and configured. There are also a few reasons not to exploit kernel level vulnerabilities from the exploit developer's point of view. Since any failed attempts will generate lead to a system crash, the exploits needs to be very reliable. Also, kernel debugging can be quite a pain to set up, especially for obscure or embedded operating systems. And of course, in general, we need at least some knowledge about kernel internals. These are some of the common targets for attack in a kernel. For local exploits, there are quite a few potential attack vectors, such as all the system calls, IO control messages, and executable file format loaders, to mention a few. For remote exploits, we are generally restricted to drivers for network interfaces and protocol handlers. Sometimes it may also be interesting with attacks that require physical access. For example, when we want to do live forensics of a system that potentially uses disk encryption, or when we need to bypass a PIN or a password on an embedded device, such as a phone or a PDA. In this case, we also want to look at drivers for hardware interfaces, such as USB devices. As for the payload, we often want to do a privilege escalation, which for Unix-based systems is usually as simple as altering a user ID field. In Windows, we may steal or duplicate an access token from a privileged process. If our user land process is restricted somehow, we can use our kernel mode payload to, break, uh, to bypass it, for instance, by breaking out of a change root directory. The most powerful payload strategy, and especially useful for remote exploits, is to inject a backdoor directly into the kernel. Uh, some of the things we often need to do in our payload to make it reliable is automatically determining addresses and offsets. This can be done by parsing the L4P headers in memory to resolve the symbols. It may also be done by pattern matching, for instance, by searching, searching for certain instruction sequences. As a last resort, we may simply hard code the addresses and offsets we need for specific kernel releases. Uh, for local privilege escalation exploits, there are also some operating system and architecture specific techniques that can come in handy. Here are some examples of how to determine the address to the process or the thread structure pointer on various systems. And as a golden rule for kernel exploits, we need to clean up and mess we create. If the bug we exploited was an overflow, which is often the case, we need to restore same values for any okay. What happened? Okay. Um, for any important data that was overwritten. For stack-based overflows, we might get away with restoring stack frame, be stack frame beyond the stack data that we have overwritten. And for heap-based overflows, we may need to repair the heap. And now over to our first real-world example, the GDI bug. GDI stands for Graphics Device Interface, and is used for handling all kinds of GUI objects, such as windows, fonts, etc. The data for these objects uh, are stored in a memory section, which is, which is shared between user mode processes and the kernel. This memory section is mapped read-only into GUI processes by default, but it turns out that the section can be remapped read-write. Crashing the entire system can be achieved by just overwriting the table with trash, but that's not very fun. So, is there a way to exploit it? As for finding the bug, I didn't in this case. The bug was made public in November last year during the month of kernel bugs project. 
And Microsoft was actually notified about it over two years ago, but obviously didn't take it very seriously at the time. Perhaps because they didn't think it could be reliably exploited. When the bug had been public for about a month, and neither an exploit nor a patch had been released, I decided to look into it myself. And after a couple of days, I had a working exploit. It was finally patched in, in the middle of April this year, a couple of weeks after I demonstrated my exploit for it at Black Hat Europe. The first step in the analysis of this vulnerability was finding a reliable way to determine the GDI section handle so we can remap it to gain write access to the section. My basic idea was to find it by pattern matching. If we know the size and contents of the GDI section, we can easily determine when we found it. And this is the first thing we need to know. The GDI section contains an array of structs with these fields, and each entry in the table is 16 bytes large. Combined with the fact that the maximum number of GDI objects in Windows 2000 is 4,000 hex, and in Windows XP is 10,000 hex, we can determine the minimum size for a valid GDI section. We may also be interested in knowing how the handle to a GDI object is interpreted. The lower 16 bits of the handle is actually used as the index into the GDI section table. And the upper 16 bits of the handle is used as a sanity check and must match the N upper field for the entry with this index. This is quite useful for us to know when we brute force the handle to the GDI section. My fi final method is this. We create the GDI object and we calculate the index where it's supposed to be at by taking the lowest 16 bits of the handle to this object. Then we calculate the value that an upper field should have by taking the upper 16 bits of the handle. Then for each memory section that we're able to map, we check the section size, and we get the entry in the table where our GDI object should be. We check the process ID and the n upper fields, and if you're as paranoid as I am, also check the type field. This will have different values depending on, on what type of GDI object we created. To actually start analyzing the vulnerabilities to see if it can be exploited, I need to set up a kernel debugging environment. Being mainly a Unix guy, I had no previous experience of Windows kernel debugging, but was eager to learn. There are two main options, SoftEyes and WinDBG. But since SoftEyes was discontinued a while back, WinDBG seemed like a better choice. One problem with WinDBG is that it normally requires two physical machines connected to a serial cable, but this is easily solved by using VMware. Being able to overwrite pointers are always interesting for us exploit developers. And in the GDI section, there are two for each GUI object. One is a usermoid pointer used in the process which owns the GUI object in question. The other is a kernel mode pointer used in kernel context. By manipulating these pointers, we hope to be able to eventually achieve an overwrite to an arbitrary memory address. If we decide to target the user mode pointer, we might be able to exploit it through a privileged process, but this would probably be very hard to do gener generically. And of course, exploiting it in kernel context is much more fun. So, I decided to, to attack the P kernel info pointer. Since the P kernel info pointer will point to a different type of struct depending on which type of GDI object is being used, I realized I had to try creating different types of objects seemed quite likely that somewhere along the line, a call to a GDI-related syscall would eventually turn up writing to something in this struct. After a lot of test cases and a lot of help from WinDBG and IDA Pro, I came up with this. When brush objects are destroyed with the NTGDI delete object app syscall, then the pointer at index 9 is written to with a fixed value 2, but only if the value at index 2 is set and the value at index 0 is set to the object's own handle. As it turns out, this technique was reliable enough to be used for exploiting all of the vulnerable system, which was, <coughs> which was all the Windows 2000 and all Windows XP systems at the time. There are still a couple of problems to solve before we have a full exploit, though. First, we need to find a suitable address to overwrite, preferably a function pointer. The data that is written to this function pointer will be the fixed value 2, but this is quite enough for our purposes, since we can place the payload on any address in the exploit process. But how do we find a suitable function pointer? 
To be suitable for us, it must be possible to reliably determine its address. It must also be called in the context of our exploit process. And to avoid a crash, we need to use a function pointer which is very unlikely to be called by any other process while our exploit is executing. The obvious choice is a rarely used system call, which would be very easy to trigger a call to from within our exploit. There are actually two system call tables in Windows, one for the native NT API and one for the Win32 subsystem. My first cho choice was overwriting a syscall in a native API table, which was co quite convenient since there were already documented ways to determine its address. And it worked great, except for under Windows XP Service Pack 1. So, why didn't it work? Well, turns out that this syscall table is actually stored in a read-only memory section, but the read-only property is not enforced in kernel context, except for under XP Service Pack 1 for some weird reason. I wanted something more reliable. When I looked at the other syscall table, I noticed that it's actually stored in the writable data segment of the Win32 module, which is perfect for us, but since there is no documented method to determine its address, I had to, came, I had to come up with a method myself. So, I had two ideas based on pattern matching. This one was not entirely reliable. The final method is to search the code for the call to the function that registers the Win32 syscall table and extract the address from the arguments that are being passed. As for the payload, I want to elevate the privileges of my exploit process, and unlike in Unix-based system, this can be quite complicated. What we do is actually to temporarily steal a so-called access token from a privileged process, and at first I had some reliability issues with this. I'll solve this by restoring the original access token for the exploit process after I'm done. And the final result is a reliable exploit for all of the vulnerable Windows XP and Windows 2000 systems. There were some values that had to be adjusted, but this is automatically done by the exploit. Now time for a demonstration. Okay, so I'll first just show a command line version of the exploit. Okay, I didn't have the, the newest version on this VMware. Yeah, we have system privileges. And we can do stuff like changing the password for the root account, which is the administrator account on this machine. And we can see here that we were an unprivileged user from the beginning. And we can't do privileged stuff. Uh, anyway, I think it would be perhaps more interesting to combine this exploit with another exploit. So I decided to uh, implement it as a payload to another exploit I had written for um, uh, an Office XP bug that was find, found by Christer here when he uh, accid accidentally fussed, uh, was fussing uh, Office XP instead of Office 2003, which we were, we were targeting, targeting at the time. Uh, anyway, I'll open the exploit document. Looks pretty normal. And let's see what happens in another VMware instance here. We've got a shell, and this was listening to um, port 8080. So, uh, I think the most useful, um, well, well, useful for an attacker way to use a local privilege escalation exploit for Windows is obviously to com combine it with another remote exploit or semi-remote exploit, like a client bug or a bug in Office XP or just to prepend it to the installer of their Trojan or something. So I think even though it's a local bug, it is quite dangerous. Well, anyway, now over to the next speaker. So, Christer.
I'm going to talk about a NetBSD kernel vulnerability. Uh, it's a vulnerability that is, it is currently an ODA. Um, it is very similar to another vulnerability I presented in Amsterdam. Uh, I found the vulnerability by using our fuzzing tool developed by my colleague Klaus. Uh, what I did was to write a script that generated sockets using random combinations of domain types and protocols and then attempted to bind them with a random socket address. And this led to an almost instant crash, and I began tracking the vulnerability down, and it was simple to do because I was familiar with the code, and I've already exploited a very similar vulnerability. The debugger I used uh, is called DDB. It's the default uh, kernel debugger on BSD. Uh, the kernel can also be used, debug used, you can also use GDB to debug the kernel, uh, either by analyzing a crash dump file or setting up a serial connection between two machines and do live debugging. I've prepared a little demonstration um, showing off DDB. So, oh. So, here we have a user logged onto the machine and he's left his workstation and locked the console. And I can't find the key, so I use a keyboard combination to break into the debugger. <coughs> and I'm going to kill the process. And now I need to reset the terminal. <clears throat> and I'm just a normal user. So I'm going to write a little exploit for, um, well, exploit to get root access using the kernel debugger. So I enter the debugger again to set a breakpoint. <coughs> Run the program and the breakpoint hits and I'm setting another breakpoint. This S user function is basically basically just um, returning zero if it's a root user calling. And of course, if root is trying to do a set user ID, the system is going to allow it. So now I'm going to change the return value. So I change the return value so of that function. And now I've got a root shell. I root shell. Okay. Uh, so the vulnerability I'm going to talk about is a straightforward buffer overflow. Uh, it's a call to be copied with a user supplied length argument and an mbuff pointer is overwritten and then subsequently freed and exploited. And an MBUF is basically just a, a kernel memory unit. And it's used throughout the networking code for things like um, socket buffers and packet data. And the MBUFs are arranged in a linked list, a doubly linked list. <clears throat> I've exploited MBUFs in two different ways on, on NetBSD. Uh, the first technique I've used was a simple unlinked technique, uh, very, very similar to exploiting malloc and free bugs. 
Um, the second technique uses a very, very hacker-friendly feature um, where you have a function pointer in the actual MBUF header to a function it wants to be freed by. So you can just <clears throat> take this function pointer and point it to your payload, and when free is called on this MBUF, your payload will be executed. And this is the function that is eventually going to free our uh, MBUF, and all I want to show is that I'm, um, I end up in a while loop when we're, when we're freeing this MBUF. And instead of breaking out of this while loop using the conditional statement, uh, I'm going to do it in a slightly different way. <clears throat> so first, but the unlink technique, like I said, exploitation is based around unlinking an MBUF from this doubly linked list. And this is the macro that performs that unlinking. And what is basically happening here is two memory operations. And I'm going to illustrate it with an example. So say your next ref pointer is uh, pointing to address dead beef and your uh, previous reference point pointer is pointing to bad code, and then the memory operations can be described with the two C statements here. So dead beef is written to address of bad code plus an offset and the other way around. So we can write to an arbitrary uh, kernel memory address if we control these two pointers. <coughs> And we have a few options uh, how to take control of the kernel using this overwrite. We can overwrite the return address on the stack. Uh, the problem with that is we don't know exactly where on the stack the return pointer is or at what address it will be. Also, we need the return value uh, to return to whoever called us in the first place. Uh, Another option is to take a function pointer for, from an IOCTL, for example, and just uh, overwrite the function pointer to point to your payload and then execute IOCTL to execute the payload for you. The problem with that is we don't necessarily know uh, the original value that we're overwriting, the value of that function pointer. And we really, really need to restore it because if somebody else calls that IOC tell after us, they're going to crash the kernel. So what I do in my exploit, I use a, a symbol called uh, sysint, which is basically as an array of function pointers to the functions implementing the system calls. And I take an unused system call number um, and then take that function pointer, point it to my payload, execute uh, the payload, payload by executing the system call. And since I'm overwriting a known value, this uh, function pointer I'm using, I can easily restore it. When you're using this technique, uh, the MBUF that you're freeing is going to be put back into a memory pool. The problem with this is it doesn't really belong there in, and will crash the kernel unless you clean it up. And the code behind the scenes is not very, very easy to read and understand, and it changes from release to release. But there is a very, very easy workaround. Uh, you can just call a function to reinitialize the entire thing, and that takes care of the problem. <coughs> uh -huh. The second technique and the technique I'm actually using in this exploit I'm going to show is using this function pointer. Uh, and to exploit this, we're going down the same execution path. But I want to avoid unlinking from taking place. And the way to do that is to take the next ref pointer and point it to the MBA for freeing. And then just take this function pointer uh, for the free function and point it to the payload, and the payload is executed on free. And when you're using this technique, n no attempt is ever made to put, put the MBUF back into the memory pool, so there is nothing to clean up, which is very nice. <sighs> so 
my payload is very, very simple. All I need to do is uh, elevate my process privileges to root. To do this, I need to find my process, uh, my, my process pro point, pointer. Uh, there are a few ways you can do that. The best way to do it is probably to use the FS register. And by using that, you can get a, rep, uh, a pointer to an LWP structure, which contains a reference to your proc structure. When you have your proc structure, uh, you can find your process credentials uh, quite easily. And then all you have to do is modify them and change your user ID to zero. To break out of that while loop I showed you, I'm just executing an extra leave instruction from my payload, and which will take me to a stack frame higher up. And since the kernel can reference user space memory, I don't have to copy the payload into the kernel. I can just simply return to a user space address. So. So now I've got root access. And I'm using actually a patched kernel, so I'm not cheating and using my old NetBSD exploit. This is a new exploit. I'm, I'm, I'm not very good at Windows, but something tells me that if you can get an EIP that you control remotely, something is really, really wrong. And that's Klaus trying to talk. Hello. Hi. <laughs> I'm going to talk about my payload for the OpenBSD, IP version 6 remote and buff overflow. Uh, this bug was found and researched by Alfredo Ortega at Core. So he deserves the great credit for finding this bug. Um, the vulnerable code differs a bit in the various OpenBSD releases, so I focused only on 3.7 up to 4.0 in my implementation. The bug is uh, triggered by sending specially crafted uh, ICMP uh, version 6 packets, which causes a uh, complete MBUF structure to get overwritten. And I won't go into details about taking control of the execution flow when controlling an MBUF structure, since Krister already talked about that. Uh, there are some other ways to, to uh, control the flow as well. But uh, the proof of concept code overrides the X3 function pointer. And when X3 is called, ECX and EBX and ESI all points to the start of the overwritten MBUF. So jumping to ESI, ESI would makes us end up uh, at the start of the overwritten MBUF. And from there, we, we jump backwards about 200 bytes to, to reach uh, stage one. So my payload has uh, three stages. Stage one, uh, which installs a backdoor. Uh, and that's a wrapper for the ICMP6 input function. We use this function since uh, we send ICMP6 packets to trigger the vulnerability. So we know that we can reach the target system if, uh, if the exploit succeeded. The stage two is uh, the actual backdoor, the code that wraps uh, 
the ICMP6 input function and uh, listens for incoming packets and check for backdoor commands. I implemented uh, four different um, state three commands. Uh, we'll go through them later on in this talk. The first thing that stage one does is to locate stage two. Stage two is sent in a previously sent uh, ICMP echo requests packet, version six, of course. And uh, when X3 is called from within the M3M function, we have uh, a pointer to, to the MBUF chain for the previous packet at 108 bytes from ESP. So all we have to do is traverse that MBUF chain to the end and fetch the data pointer, pointer in the last MBUF to get a, a pointer to stage two. Sometimes during heavy network traffic, uh, it might be possible that another packet is the previous packet. So there are some checks as well to make sure that it's, it's actually the stage two. Uh, for example, there, there are um, some magic bytes in the beginning of the payload, and I check the pointer on the stack that the, that the high order byte uh, uh, is the same as the high order byte for the overwritten MBUF, and check various MBUF flags and stuff like that. So, uh, but, it, but it works most, most of the time. Uh, <coughs> oh, sorry. Um, the stage two also contains a, a symbol resolver. So stage one calculates the address to the symbol resolver, uh, which is an offset from, from the start of stage two. We'll talk more about the symbol, symbol resolver later, but now that we can resolve symbols, we, we resolve the INET6 SV array and, and uh, fetches the, the address of the current ICMP6 input function since stage uh, two need to know this. Um, we make sure that the backdoor is not installed. Uh, well, you, can, you might want to upgrade or something, but I didn't implement it that way. So we, we check for the backdoor, and if it's not installed, we simply clean up the, the stack and return. The backdoor uh, does not start with the traditional saving of the frame pointer, but with a call instruction to get its current location uh, so that we can fetch uh, so-called arguments, which is prepended to the code. And that's, for example, the, the, the address to the real, the, the real ICMP6 input function. So it's enough to compare the first four bytes to to see if the backdoor is installed or not. Since we uh, can resolve symbols, we, al uh, we resolve malloc and we allocate kernel memory for stage two and copy, uh, copy the code there. We then wrap the ICMP6 input function by overwriting the function pointer inside the init 6 uh, SV array. And we can do this without raising any locks since all the locks we need are currently in place because we came here from, a, from an interrupt. When the backdoor is installed, we just clean up the stack and return. So now we have the backdoor in place, which uh, listens for all the incoming ICMP6 packets. The symbol resolver um, <coughs> part of stage two is, is uh, really nice, and all the stages uses it. It saves a lot of, a lot of uh, trouble because we, we don't need any hard-coded addresses to symbols. The ELF header is not mapped at a fixed address on OpenBSD, as for, for example on FreeBSD. But my colleague, uh, you will notice that it was mapped right off the BSS segment, so we simply scan for the ELF tag from there to find it. And then we, we, uh, we look up the symbols pretty much as you do in a Windows shell code by comparing hashes of symbol strings in the DINSIM section. The ELF symbol resolver that I used in my payload was initially written by Christer for another project, so the code was modified a bit and later used in, in, in this code. Stage two simply listens, uh, as I said, for ICMP6 um, packets with magic bytes indicating that it's a backdoor command in the payload. It then copies stage three, the backdoor command to run, uh, to allocated memory, and, and wraps the system call with this command. 
It then calls the real ICMP6 input function and return with a return value from that function. Okay. To, uh, to be able to, to uh, uh, perform syscalls from within the kernel is really nice. Uh, it opens up and it, it, make it makes it really easy to write kernel shellcode and highly portable. So uh, my code works on all the releases. To, it's, there, there's not, nothing different between them. Um, the thing is that we need a process context to be able to use system calls. And we, come, we came from, from an interrupt, so, so we don't really have that. So we wrap a system call, and when the system call is, uh, when the system call is called from a process, we fork from this process to create a new process to play with. I looked a bit at the, at the default installation in the source code, and the get time of day was called quite frequently, so I used that one, and it works good. Um, the state three command needs to know which system call we wrapped to be able to call it later on. Uh, the index is enough, since we can resolve the system table and, uh, later on. Um, the address of the real... Uh, handler of the system call uh, is, is also, as well as the index, prepended to the state three command and can later be extracted from an offset of the value of EIP. So I implemented four different uh, state three commands. The, the traditional TCP connect back, which spawns a shell, a raw shell, we might want to be able to uh, change the secure level, such as for uh, loading kernel modules later on. So I implemented a command that allows us to set the secure level to an arbitrary value. Depending on the system that we are attacking, it might be firewall rules and stuff like that preventing us to create a connect back connection. So we need a way to, to, to modify the, the rules. Or, so I implemented a, a command for us to, to run arbitrary shell commands, just as the, as the system function in the C library. We won't get any output from, from this command, obviously. So the standard out and error is sent to, to the out, output of the, of the process that calls get time, time of day, which we wrapped. So just have to make sure to redirect it to device null or whatever when you type it on the command line. The last command uh, uninstalls the backdoor. I don't know why you want to do that, but uh, I needed it while testing and developing, so it's still in there. It would have been nice with, with some um, commands for, for transferring files as well, but uh, I didn't do that. It works with the traditional old Unix commands once you have a TCP connect back connection. The state three commands are all implemented in similar ways. They all use the state two resolver to resolve symbols. And the first, and the first thing they do is to reset the wrapped system call with a, with a real uh, value so that the correct handler handles the next call to, to the wrapped system call. Uh, we don't want it to be called more than once. It then calls the real system call, saves the return value so that the calling process won't detect that we, we um, used it to create a new process. It then forks from, from the calling process to create uh, the process that actually does uh, the way, the stuff that we wanted to do. Uh, before we start uh, connecting back or whatever, we're supposed to do, we have to make sure that we run with root privileges. Since any, any process can call the, the wrapped system call, we have to uh, just simply set the real user ID to zero before continuing to do whatever we want to do. And just simply terminates the process on failure. We, we control the newly, uh, the fork process in kernel memory, so we simply uh, point it to to uh, a function where it, where it starts executing and uh, run the system calls we need from there. For example, uh, socket, connect, and stuff like that. I, I have some technical problems with my, um, 
I'm hardware. So I was going to play a, a VMware recording of, of the exploit in action instead. Um, it will be available anyway, so you can play around with, with yourself. We will be attacking uh, OpenBSD 4.0 here. So uh, we will solve the MAC address. And uh, starting to attack. So now the backdoor is installed in kernel space, uh, running there, looking at every packet arriving to the uh, ICMP6 input function. I, I, I don't have any firewall rules and stuff like that uh, on the machine here, so we just simply create the connect back connection. The first thing we do. So what happened, happened there was that we, we, we sent this single ICMP6 uh, echo request packet containing the code, the state three, three, three um, command for connect back, and waited for get time of day to get called. And when get, when get time of day was called, it connected back to us and created this shell. Uh, we continue to uh, check the current value of the secure level. which is two, the highest possible. We then check in the temp directory, just to see it's empty. We then exit and uh, set the secure level to minus one, which is m more convenient. And just to show the, the implementation of, of, of the arbitrary shell commands, we grep for a root in the master password file and store it in a file in the temp directory. We then create a new connect back shell to um, check the changes on the target machine. And uh, check for the file in the temp directory. That's it, job done. And well, since we are nice people, we uninstall it as well. Okay, actually the movie continues to um, show that all the other releases works as well, but we don't want to see that now. Uh, so, you will, can you please take care of your laptop? Thanks. Uh, over to my friend, uh, Carl, which is going to talk about some other stuff. Hello. Oh. Hello, my name is Carl. I'm going to talk about uh, uh, kernel uh, exploit for a vulnerability in FreeBSD 6.0. This is a vulnerability in the wireless subsystem of FreeBSD. And this was found by me in mid-2005, and uh, then um, it was also re uh, released an uh, update to fix this. Uh, first of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about auditing the code, and then later on the implementation of the exploit. Uh, First of all, the wireless uh, subsystem in FreeBSD, the code is relatively new. Uh, and the wireless code has a pretty complex link layer protocol. And uh, there were some uh, obstacles uh, that I uh, came across while auditing this code. First of all, the code is not written to be easily read, at not least uh, for me. It contains some huge switch statements and tricky macros and uh, those sorts of things that make it hard for an auditor. And uh, the management layer uh, for the wireless protocol, it is unauthenticated and unencrypted, which makes it uh, pretty convenient for a uh, malicious uh, person. And uh, while I was uh, 
auditing this code, I found a local issue, uh, ILCTL, which, uh, which it was possible to retrieve some kernel memory, we disclose some kernel memory. That was interesting, but um, while I was continuing looking, I found something more interesting. That was uh, another IOCTL, uh, and that IOCTL is, um, is the IOCTL which, re re which returned the access points in the vicinity. Uh, and this is called after a prior scan. And here is uh, some of the code that implement that. And we're going to have a little bit of a look into this code. And uh, the union U here is a local stack variable. This is used by the kernel to uh, construct uh, a portion of data that, that is later on copied out to user space. Uh, and this is the loop which iterate over all the access points that the kernel has in a, in a list uh, that, is, that it is uh, knowledgeable about. And the, first of all, it calls a function, uh, you see there, get scan result. And this function, it calculates the amount of, uh, amount of memory need, needed for some um, dynamic sized uh, fields attached to these access points. And then it later on copy, copy out those uh, dynamic sized fields to this temporary buffer that we talked about earlier, the union U. Uh, and to dive into this, we will look a little bit further into this uh, get scan result function. And this function, as I said, calculate the length, the size of these dynamic fields, and uh, these fields are the SSID, uh, and it, it is the VME and the VPI. A, sorry, VPA and the VMI. Uh, and the, the uh, VMI and the VPA are, uh, can both have a length of 255 bytes, uh, and the SSID is constrained to 32 bytes. Uh, and if you see there, uh, there is a variable called ISR IE LAN. This is the length of the two, uh, the two biggest uh, dynamic fields here. And uh, they are added together and then added to, together to the uh, total length of those dynamic fields. There is, a, however, a problem here. Um, the ISR IE LAN is uh, declared as an unsigned 8-bit uh, integer. And uh, as you might notice, uh, if you have uh, those two fields, and if they have a sum that is larger than that 255, that is the maximum uh, value of this unsigned int uh, 8-bit, then we have a problem. Uh, and that could probably, or it can be used by the malicious user. And now we want to test our theories and see if it is possible for us to do something useful with this. So what we do is to hard code a uh, test case into the kernel, and uh, we create a custom kernel uh, with the debugging support with GDB and DDB. Uh, and Christo, he talked earlier about it, so I think you are pretty uh, familiar with that. And uh, then we want to enable the uh, DDB as the current debugger. Uh, and we trigger the affected code path. In this case, we just issue an ifconfig with the scan command. This will call this IOCTL, uh, which was vulnerable. And uh, here is the output of the DDB when uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, panic was occurring because we had a page fault within the kernel, so uh, we had some problems here. And if we look at the virtual address here, we see that it is 41, 41, 41, 55. And we provided uh, some data here with a lot of capital A's, which is 41 hexadecimal. So we see that we can control the, uh, some, some, uh, some of the values here. And uh, 
we want to investigate this a little bit further and we want something better than the DDB here. Uh, and uh, to, to go a little bit deeper into this, we want GDB. And, uh, but first of all, we want to ask us the question, can this be triggered remotely? Because that would be much more interesting. Uh, because the IF config from a local machine is not very uh, useful. Uh, and as a matter of fact, there is an application called VPA Supplicant, uh, and this is regularly calling this IOCTL while scanning for access points in the vicinity. And uh, this uh, application, VPA Supplicant, it is needed to authenticate to any access point providing better encryption than web on FreeBSD. So if you have an access point with high encryption, then you, then you are probably running VPA Supplicant. So, uh, and uh, now we want to construct the, the malicious frame that uh, make th this happen. And to do that, I've uh, modified NetBSD, so it was able, I was able to send arbitrary raw frames from NetBSD with the BPF device. And uh, as I said earlier, we want to switch to a better debugging environment, GDB. And uh, now we introduce another computer. We introduce a debugger machine. And this is attached uh, to the target machine with a serial cable. And then we um, configure the target machine so it will enable this uh, GDB. And uh, here is the beacon frame sent in there to the target, and uh, we drop into GDB on the, tar on the uh, debugger machine here. And now we have the source code, so it's much easier for us to investigate this problem. And if we look here, the IREC was a local uh, variable, so we have clearly overwritten a local uh, stack variable. And if we look at the backtrace, we have also uh, overwritten uh, some frames further up. Oops. Um, and uh, here is a dump of the local variable u, which was the big union that uh, was the temporal buffer that the kernel copied into before copying out to the user space. And if we you see all the red here, and that's the capital A's, our supply data, and if we look at the frame pointer here, we see that it is in the middle of this. So we have clearly overwritten the saved, re saved return address and all that stuff. So now we have a good, uh, we have a good uh, position here to do something useful here, to develop and exploit here. And what we want to do here is to find a suitable va value to put there as the return address. And we can't rely on stack variables, uh, stack addresses, as the, it is very unpredictable for us, especially as we are exploiting this remotely. So what we need to do here is to, or what I did, was to search the kernel image uh, for a generic kernel, and I searched it for a, uh, an instruction which, which makes it possible for us to res resume the execution. So. For example, if we have this instruction jump ESP, uh, we will have the execution uh, resumed after our overwritten saved return address. And uh, here is just a small script, uh, and this uh, will search for suitable byte sequences, and the FFEF is one, one of those. And this was actually found in the generic kernel here, so I could use this one. So now we have the possibility to uh, execute our code within the kernel space. And uh, now we need, to, uh, we need to figure something out. We need to figure out what to put here. And this initial payload is pretty limited. First of all, um, it can't be too, too large because uh, if we make it too large, it will overwrite uh, another frame uh, further up that we really want to have intact because we want to resume the execution after we are done because uh, we don't want uh, uh, the caller of the IOCTL to 
completely fail here. So uh, if, if we limit this to 32 bytes, we will be okay. So this initial state one payload uh, is 32 bytes in my exploit here. And what it does is to locate a second stage payload here. And uh, this, this code, it will traverse some kernel lists, locate that second stage payload, and then jump to it. Um, not, nothing more than that. And uh, the second stage payload, um, it is responsible to do the actual installation of this backdoor. So what this has to do is to allocate memory for this backdoor. It will copy some backdoor data into this newly allocated memory. It will save um, the man man management frame handler function pointer. Uh, and this management frame handler is the one responsible to uh, take care of all the management frame received to this interface, the interface of the machine we are exploiting. And then it will overwrite this uh, management frame handler with a pointer to our backdoor code. And then we restored the, um, we restored the stack uh, with, from, with a frame two levels up. So we can uh, exit the IOCTL nicely and we return a list without any access point and without any errors. So the ca calling application, in this case the EPA supplicant, it won't get any failure here. And the management frame handler I, I was talking about, um, that is the the function, it is very similar to the ICMP uh, input function that uh, Klaus talked about earlier, but this is the one, hand, the one function responsible to handle all the management traffic to the station. And uh, what we do here is to look in, in, uh, inspect all the incoming frames, and we look for a magic number at a fixed position. And if this magic number is found, it will pass it on to the back door uh, to the backdoor itself and process the command as it assume uh, is a backdoor command. If that magic number isn't found, it will pass it on to the real management handler. As I said earlier, we, we stored away uh, a pointer to the original management frame handler. In this way, we are uh, transparent to the normal operation, so we don't interfere with the normal, normal uh, wireless uh, management here. So the, the target won't uh, notice any difference if he has the backdoor or if he doesn't. So uh, now the backdoor is in place. And what it does is uh, if it wants to send back data to the attacker uh, from a, uh, to the attacker, it, it sends them back with a probe response frame. So we are, uh, we are, we are only communicating in the management frame layer. And uh, when the attacker sends commands to the backdoor itself, it, it, sell, it sends themselves in the, as a probe uh, request. So our backdoor communication is with probe requests and probe responses. So in this case, we never send any, uh, any data on the data uh, level. Uh, Uh, and uh, the backdoor I've implemented here implements uh, three commands. It is a ping command, upload, and uh, an execute. And with this upload and execute command, it is possible to implement a dynamic plugin facility, which makes it possible for us to, uh, to uh, insert more backdoor code uh, on the fly and then later on call this. So, uh, and uh, what I've done is to implement a, a file server plugin, so we have the ability to browse the target file system, and we can read arbitrary files and create and write arbitrary files at, uh, as well on the target system. And we are dealing with an unreliable medium here, so it's very important that we take care of uh, 
dropped frames, etc. So every, every command is acknowledged by the backdoor. In this way, we keep all the logic and all the resending on the target side. So this simplifies the implementation. And, uh, let's see here. Uh, and all the file system operations we do, we do them at the uh, VFS level. So we don't, uh, we don't call any system calls, etc. So this is pretty stealthy. And uh, we just uh, dust the file system operations the way that uh, a system call would have done it. Uh, and, uh, and as the payload and the exploit uh, will be presented to you later on, uh, I won't go into all the details because there's a lot of obstacles that you might have occur here, but it, it's better to have a look at the real uh, code later on. And as a last word, I would like to say that the, the wireless framework in BSD is a huge work, and it deserves a lot of credit because it unifies a lot of things, but it might need some cleaning up and security auditing. And uh, now I'm going to demonstrate this uh, exploit that I was talking about, and I will have to fix the monitors and see if it will show anything for you. Okay, so, yeah. So uh, this is the target machine. This is running FreeBSD 6.0. This is uh, my attacker here running NetBSD with my customized kernel. And uh, this is the access point here that we are using. And uh, this uh, client, this target, mach uh, this target machine, is authenticated to that access point using VPA PSK, uh, and the traffic should be encrypted with uh, TKIP. Uh, and, oops, we should have a, a look at that now. So uh, on my attacker machine now, which I switched to now, I have a sniffer installed. And unfortunately, we have pretty poor resolution on this machine, so we have to see if this is, if we can see something here, but I think we can do something useful here. Uh, over to the target machine. First of all, we want to verify the connection to the access point here. And we open up Mozilla here, and uh, we're going to connect to the web interface on that access point. So, uh, like this. Okay, so here we have the web page of that one. We reload it a couple of times. Oops, sorry. So, reload it some more. Here, switch over to the attacker. And uh, I will filter some traffic out here because it's a, a lot of a lot of traffic in this uh, in the air here. So let's see here. Here we have some traffic. Here. Okay, so this is data sent from the client to the uh, access point here. And uh, if we're going to have a little bit of a look here into this frame that is sent. And uh, we see that this frame is uh, encrypted with TKIP. So the, the data itself is not uh, readable by us, the attacker. Uh, so we need to do something else here. Uh, in this case, we want to use this exploit to get hold on the, uh, on the target machine. And uh, this is my exploit application. It has a couple of options here on the right side panel. It can search for access points, for example. 
and it will passively listen at all the beacon frames sent into the air here. So we see the triple X SSI ID, and this is our network, and we search for client here. And now we are a little bit intrusive here because we are disassociating all the uh, clients associated to that network because, again, the management layer is unauthenticated and unencrypted, so we are free to uh, disassociate any user, and we do that. Now we have the MAC address of the access point and the client here. So this is what we need to mount the tag here. And uh, we, we just uh, install the backdoor here, uh, sending the exploit. So at this point, we are switching over here to the target, and it lost connectivity to the access point. Because I said earlier, we want or we need VPA supplicant to call this IOCTL. And it does that when it's in the searching state. And because the frames are unauthenticated and unencrypted, unencrypted it is trivial for us to uh, get the, the target into that state. And it, it is like this for maybe 10 or 20 seconds. And now again, he has connectivity to the access point. And uh, if we look on the attacker machine here, we have hopefully, or I know we have installed our backdoor, and we got a pong response here, and this is our, this is not a ping command of an ICMP ping, but our uh, backdoor command. So uh, we upload the file server to the uh, target machine, and uh, now we are browsing the file system on that machine, the target, and and we might want to just have a look here on a, a copyright file for BSD. It is uh, resided on the root directory on the target machine here. And we can just switch over here to the, uh, we switch over to the sniffer. So we, we will have a little bit of a look here on how this, ma uh, the backdoor traffic is seen in the air. Okay, so we have to filter some out because there's a lot of frames in this dump here. And let's see here. Okay, so what we see here is a um, probe response. And if we look at the the bottom, uh, the bottom here, we see that uh, this is the command from the attacker to the uh, target. And this is, he is specifying which file he wants to read from. And then the next frame, it is uh, within a probe response. And it is, uh, we have some data here on the optional probe response field. And can have a look here. And okay, so it won't inter interpret this, but this is the this is parts of the file of the copyright file here. So now we are browsing the target uh, file system, and oh. so we entered the home directory of the user here, of the only user on this machine. And I'm switching over to the target machine again. Uh, create a folder here. Okay, so now we just create a file here with unknown content. this, and we switch over to the attacker here. Uh, there it is. Okay, so we do the refresh directory, see a new directory. Here we have a, a secret file, 
and yeah, see the content there. And uh, while we are doing this, we can uh, we can also just upload a file to the target. Yes, see. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, yes, upload. Oops. What is it? Upload file server. Okay, that was not. Okay, so now we switch over to the target machine. Okay, and we reload the directory here, and we see a new file here. Uh, no. It's an executable, okay. <laughs> I, because on the, on the target, on the attacker machine, we can, uh, we can say what kind of permissions we want to have the file be created on, on the uh, target machine. And I accidentally ticked the executable flag here. Um, that's why you saw that dialog. Okay, uh, we just want to finish up here. And um, what we might want to do here uh, as an attacker is to just have a quick look at the passphrase used to uh, authenticate to that access point, so we don't need to do this exploitation anymore uh, if we want to associate to this network. So here is the passphrase that I'm using. So now I've demonstrated this. Uh, yeah, okay, I, I can just mention that it is, of course, trivial to obfuscate and even encrypt the communication between the backdoor and the attacker, and I have implemented just an XOR, uh, XOR obfuscator here, but I won't show it here because it, it's, yeah, it's, uh, you can see it yourself if you want uh, when you have the application yourself. Okay, so I have, I'm finished with my demonstration now. Is there any questions? No questions? What's that? Uh, yeah? Excuse me? Yeah, it was by auditing source code. So it was no fussing or anything like that. Any more questions? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Uh, any more questions? No. Okay, we are finished then.